Do you want your child to speak Spanish fluently but need classes to be affordable and fit your busy schedule? It's time to try True Fluency Kids, the leading online Spanish immersion program for children. Experienced native speaking teachers use live, fun, and engaging lessons to teach the most common words to get your child speaking Spanish with confidence right away. Use code INTUITIVEPOD20 to save 20% off your first course at truefluencykids.com. Welcome to the Intuitive Family Podcast, the show that helps your family live intuitively and thrive, not just survive. I'm your host, Camille Kirksey. Join me as I share the stories of families living outside the norm who embrace the power of intuition to make unconventional choices that align with their family values and not those of the Joneses. I can't wait for you to meet today's guest. So without further ado, let's start the show. Welcome to a new episode of the Intuitive Family Podcast. In this episode, you'll meet Kelly Edwards, mompreneur and veteran homeschooling mom of three neurodivergent girls living in the Shenandoah Valley of West Virginia. Kelly is passionate about home education, connecting families through attachment, learning as a lifestyle, and helping children and parents identify their purpose. Kelly is also a homeschool coach and creator of the 90-Minute School Day, a lifestyle approach that connects children with learning in their natural environment environment at home with their family. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Kelly from 90 Minute School Day. And if you're a homeschooler and want to hear more about her homeschooling journey, you can get access to a bonus episode where we discuss that and more by joining Homeschool U Academy, my online school for homeschooling parents. Learn more via a link in the show notes. Hey, Kelly, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for having me, Camille. I'm just delighted to be here. No problem, of course. So let's start out with you telling us a little bit about you and your family. Okay. Well, uh, my husband and I and our three kids live in the Shenandoah Valley of West Virginia, and um, we have all of our teeth. And um, the other, <laughs> the other thing you want to know about me. To know. <laughs> I know we do have our teeth. We have indoor plumbing. Um, so we live in the Shenandoah Valley of West Virginia. It's just outside of DC, and our uh, we have three daughters, all of whom are foster and adopted into our family. So they were all in the foster care system before we adopted them. And my oldest is fifteen. And then my middle daughter is nine and my youngest is five. And we have been homeschooling now. We're entering our ninth year. And so that's a little bit about me, kind of where we are, you know, who's in my home with me. We have a dog and a cat and that's about my family. Love that. So you're a homeschooler, you're a coach, you're a mompreneur, um, you're an advocate for neurodiversity and, you know, raising children who are neurodiverse. Um, Can you tell us what inspired you to get started with homeschooling and coaching and advocacy? Yes. So it it starts as everything else does with a passion project, right? And it usually is involved with a person. And so homeschooling for us, I never planned to homeschool. It was not like a deep motherhood desire of mine when I was growing up, but it became an option that we really uh, were researching, my husband and I, because our oldest daughter came to us in kindergarten and she was in the public school system for kindergarten and first grade. And when we knew that we would be adopting her, we were really looking for ways to resource her that the school wasn't able to. They weren't doing a great job academically, but she would needed a lot of social emotional support uh, that the school system just wasn't set up to do. And then we also needed to build attachment with her because she was transitioning away from her biological family and into our family. So homeschooling seemed to be a good fit. And so I took my little out of the box kid that wasn't quite fitting in the round peg at school. And we started doing school at home. So we had like a desk, we like did the pledge of allegiance. Um, My (laughs) friend Tyra, she and I laugh about this, but like her daughter had a uniform. I wasn't quite there, but It was pretty much, you know, we were in this little private school too. And um, some some things worked really well. I'm not going to say that it was all bad, but we just were constantly engaged, engaged in battles. And I had us busy from, you know, I didn't know that she didn't need as much time <laughs> at home <laughs> as she did at school. So we were busy pretty much from 9 a.m. till around one or two in the afternoon, which is way too much, especially at that age. And um, over time, it just was a process of 
looking at what wasn't learning, what wasn't working, and then moving away from that and then trying different things. So it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Mm -hmm. And eventually throughout that process that I now know is called de-schooling, I didn't know the term at the time, we kind of landed in this place through lots of, you know, different circumstances. One of which was we had two babies at the same time in our home, two infants. And that kind of like broke me. (laughs) Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you have two babies or you have a baby, um, we, we often say in homeschooling circles, like the child is the, uh, the curriculum, the new baby. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we did. We just, focused on these new babies and all of the learning that comes alongside of that. And it was through that process, in addition to kind of having been introduced to Charlotte Mason and Maria Montessori prior to that, kind of this unraveling of how we were doing school at home and moved into natural learning where it's child-centered and I'm here to support and to resource and to guide my child, but not necessarily have to be the director of the entire day. And that's where the 90 minute school day started. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, so tell us that that was great segue. Tell us about that. Okay. So the 90 minute school day was kind of the natural rhythm I found showing up in my family, how we were just moving through the day again, as a family, I had, I had recentered things. So I was following my children, was prioritizing relationship instead of the rigor. And I was realizing for me, I'm very type A. So the curriculum had become the master and I was like obeying the curriculum to the letter. And so I was checking all the boxes and looking at the timelines, constantly feeling like we had to catch up and make up and, you know, all these things. And when I kind of pushed that to the side and looked at it as a tool, instead of like the director, I was able to start to follow interests. And it stressed me out at first because my children were interested in things that weren't on my schedule. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as they do (laughs) as they do as they always do Mm -hmm. and so a lot of the battles started going away as I was releasing my mindset my very schooled mindset of this is how children learn and by educating myself through this process about really what is learning what isn't it um and then how can I support my kids that's really where I started to notice patterns and trends and out of that is where I um kind of formulated the 90 minute structure, which is just a framework that you lay over your day. And for me as the parent, especially a working parent, um, I'm at home working with my kids. I needed to know when I could work and when the kids and I would spend time together so that I wouldn't get lost in my day and then realize I hadn't had any intentional time with them, even though we were together. Like we all have those things. Yeah, for sure. I needed a metric to keep myself responsible and accountable. And that's where the 90 minute school day came. It came from just looking at the day and the framework of little lessons. Charlotte Mason is very big on little lessons, right? So a little 10 minute lesson here, 10 minute lesson here, a 20 minute activity here is how I worked out we can get a full world-class education, all of us together. And our group time was about 60 minutes and then independent invitations. So if I invite my child to participate in like their math curriculum and they don't want to, I've learned to let it go. And Mm. so they will binge math. They will like go on little vacations from math. Math happens every day anyway. And it's me seeing the value in the everyday moments that, that this method has really helped me. So it helps me plan. And then sometimes we do the plan. And then on the days that we don't do the plan, (laughs) I can look at the day and hold up the same framework. And I can see, oh, we played a game and that had math in it, or they helped me cook and they learned some fractions. And so I can still let myself know, excuse me, that we are learning, that learning is happening, even when it wasn't planned for by following them, their interests, the natural flow of our family life, they are getting all that they need every day. And so that is really my hope. And what I want to share with other homeschoolers is you can use this grid for your life as a recipe, adapt it to your family, and it helps you feel like you're doing enough because we always wonder if we're mm-hmm. doing enough. Mm-hmm. And um, anyways, it's just a great, it's a great way to do that. So I didn't know if you wanted me to tell you more about that or 
Well, we're going to get into it a little bit. I think it just, I think it'll naturally just happen that you <laughs> will tell us a little bit more of how you apply that, you know, how you've applied that to your family. And probably in this next question that I wanted to ask. So we know you're nine years in, you're going into your ninth year of homeschooling now with your kids. So when you're applying the 90 minute school day to your day, how does that look? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So how it looks for my family, and again, everybody's different, but everybody in my family is an early bird, except my middle daughter, that child can sleep all day. Mm -hmm. So that's important to notice too. Like, so our family, the majority of us operate on an earlier day. And so how it works in our home is we kind of have my husband and I both work from home. So we need quiet hours in the morning for he and I to get like our personal time in our personal study, get the day going. And so it's kind of quiet hours in the morning. And that just simply means like everybody's got something to do. So if my oldest one, she likes to hit her chores right away. So she gets her chores done. My youngest one will either be engaged in like a strewing activity or she might have some screen time. My middle child's asleep. My husband and I are having, we kind of swap around our exercise and personal time in the morning. And then we get our day going with a meal. And after that cleanup, my middle daughter is usually awake. And then we will go into like our 90 minute day, what I have planned. And so um, on a day where I have something planned and we're going to go through like a planned 90 minute day that hasn't gotten interrupted yet, it would look something like we would sit down for morning time and it might be time for second breakfast, right? So we're giving them the second snack. I just cleaned up the kitchen. That's usually when it happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hungry again. So we might sit down around the kitchen table. We might take our snacks outside. We might go to the living room. It's just kind of flexible. And we'll usually um, have some sort of sensorial activity. If I were outside, the kids are swinging in the trees and I'm reading our poetry book. And then we're, we'll be, I'm very big for us. And I think it's really helpful that morning time be the time where you kind of expand your family values and then also your, um, uh, the character of your children. This is kind of the time where like, I call it like the four F's. So it's, we're a family of faith. So we would, might do a devotional or read our Bibles, but any kind of faith um, or studying the faith of someone else in another culture, um, but faith. And then we have um, fables. You can learn so many great moral principles from fables, fairy tales. And then um, my favorite is folk tales because there's so many folk tales from so many cultures all around the world. And like our library is like stacked thick with all of these folk tales. And so you learn so much about culture and language and then the story arcs, you know, sort of like the hero's journey that is just woven through all of these timeless stories that all, you know, are walking through good versus evil. And so um, we always incorporate that into our morning time. And so that's kind of quick. And then usually we'll do our read aloud. And by that time, one of the kids has had some brilliant idea of an activity, or we might do the activity I had in my head. Mm -hmm. And then that's kind of like our, um, our 90 minutes right there, except it's really usually about 60, about 60 minutes, depending on the flow, there's interruptions and then it's lunchtime. And then after lunchtime, we go into our quiet time hours. So we do a two hour quiet time every afternoon. And that gives me time to do the dishes we pick up. And then I get to do something that's fulfilling for me. Like if you think about Charlotte Mason and mother culture, we need to be learning alongside our kids and showing them that we have a, a life outside of motherhood. Absolutely. And so, yeah. And we all kind of go to our respective corners because about that time today, people are melting down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's time. I know that all too well. Yes. <laughs> so we all kind of like, they might be inside or outside. My kids are old enough now to be outside unsupervised and um, everybody just has their time to themselves, which is really important for children to be able to be by themselves. And so that's, an, that's like a muscle to exercise. And after quiet time, it's usually somewhere in mid afternoon. And then um, my kids go into like where they might be playing with friends or they might have an activity or we might have an extracurricular. It's kind of that free time. Mm -hmm. And then we do dinner. And then after dinner, it's more quiet hours. So they might read, they might uh, listen to an audiobook, play with stuffies, but they're kind of like tucked away um, at that point. And then people kind of fall asleep whenever. Yeah. 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 That's, lovely. that's the perfect ideal day happens I, every single day. I was just going to say, yeah, I, I'm that homeschooler. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and that happens for no one. Let's just be clear. Sometimes, yeah, very rare. Yeah. 
but it's so natural and so normal. You know, that's the thing about home, the homeschool lifestyle is just flowing with what works for your family in this particular moment, because, you know, the kids are changing, you're changing, something may be going on for work, you never know with outside family and commitments, but having that routine there is so comforting, especially when you have kids that may really thrive on a routine. They really need, you know, those anchors, but having those moments of, okay, we get up, this is normally what we do. Not that we have to, but you know, you can have appointments or like we had camp in the summer where obviously we don't have that. So yeah, I think it's so natural to just follow your family's rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, not that you're dictating, dictating it, but you're just allowing it to show you where to go. Right. You know? And it, and it, and it's constant, it's a constant fluid thing. Right. And, it, and right. this is our current family rhythm and it has a lot of the same structure that we've had year after year, but things change, you know, in the mornings, the kids all used to be upstairs until about eight o'clock, but now like my little PDA or no, 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 homie, don't do that. So she's like mm -hmm. coming downstairs uh, when she wants to come downstairs. So we've just had to adapt like, okay, well, if you're going to be down here, how can we help you participate in the quiet mood so your dad and I can get our studying done? Right. Yeah. Because it's still, and that's, we want to talk about boundaries eventually too, because when you work from home, you have to have those, you know, pretty firm boundaries, especially as your kids get older and they start to understand like, oh, mom and dad have their own thing um, mm -hmm. and they need that, you know, so, but it's all about learning and practice. Like you were saying, that muscle of getting used to being more independent while you still have the support there for your family right there. You know, it's not like you're away, but they know like, OK, mom's working like now, you know, you're doing a podcast episode and my kids just happen not to be here today. But if they were, they would they would know, you know, like whatever it is, wait <laughs> if possible. But I love right. that having being able to be there and still have your own thing going on. That's a, a I, I don't like balance but that's a good balanced way to at right. least have ideal. Well, like balance is like a teeter totter, right? It's never, mm -hmm. you're never going to actually be in balance. Right. You're just hoping to kind of like in the, in the grand spectrum, you've kind of like averaged it out. For exactly. Balance. And that's normally what happens, whether <laughs> we're in control of that or not, for sure. Um, and let's talk about mindset a little bit. You mentioned it a little while ago, but in your course, in your coaching, you talk a lot about mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is having the right mindset so important when it comes to homeschooling, but specifically when it comes to homeschooling neurodivergent kids? Yeah, I think mindset is so huge. So for all of us, I think just being human, at least for me, my like natural instinct is to go negative. The world is on fire, always, never very like binary black and white thinking, right? Like you always do this. You never, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Not alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's like our natural tendencies. We kind of like go to this, like fear is as an unhealthy place rather than it being like, oh, I'm, I'm not okay right now. Something is going on inside of me. That's alerting me that something needs to be addressed. And so being able to train our mindsets when we are calm and not having the crisis, whatever the crisis of the moment is little C or big C, um, really helps us to be able to catch ourselves. And I feel like that's all it is. Life is a practice. You just said it. Like we practice with our rhythm. We have an idea deal. We adapt it as we need to. And so for mindsets, it's so important with neurodivergent children because they are really struggling just in life because the majority of the people that they interact with are neurotypical. And that just simply means they fall inside of the bell curve of everyone's different brains. And then the neurodiverse kids and adults are mm -hmm. on the outliers of that bell curve. And so society has been structured for neurotypicals and these kids are already not feeling successful in these environments that don't work as well for them. And then when we have this kind of like negative reactive response that we are kind of hardwired to have initially. <laughs> so we can give ourselves grace for that with these tough kids. We need to catch ourselves and flip it. And so for me, um, one of the biggest mindsets that's helped me over the years is to understand that for my neurodiverse kids, all of my kids are neurodiverse is that behavior is communication. So if they 
are giving me a hard time, that means they are having a hard time. And I'm the grown up here. So it's my job to pony up and try to regulate myself first so that I can help them regulate and get back to a place where they feel okay in their body. Because once you descend into your brain stem, that's a felt safety issue. And even though they are safe, I have to acknowledge that they may not feel safe. And so that is the mindset that I think can really be a game changer in everyone's homeschool and parenting journey is at least it was for me is like truly understanding that concept and assuming competence. Like our kids are doing the best they can in that moment. And yeah, they might be able to do this task. I'm asking them to on a different day, but in this moment, they can't do it. And I have to be able to recognize that because I have moments where like, you know, like we were just talking, like sometimes we hit that idyllic homeschool day on the head. Right. And we're just like, Oh, nailed it. My rhythm actually worked today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) You are like flat on your face and it's not even 9am and you're like, (laughs) where are you texting your spouse? Where are you? EPA, you know? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. For sure. So Yeah. yeah, that's, that's kind of like, approaching it from that growth mindset instead of that scarcity mindset is so critical and, and is, and there's that duality to everything. So that's where the mind shift needs to happen. Recognizing where you are, are you in scarcity mode or are you in growth mode and making mm-hmm. the switch? Yeah. And it takes so much awareness. Cause so, you know, I would venture to say the majority of us do not grow up with that awareness. Um, we understand it as children, but we don't, we're not taught how to respond in a way, how to check in with ourselves, what that even looks like. And, you know, like, I love how you were talking about the feeling of it. It doesn't matter if it, if they look like they're okay, like the house isn't on fire, right? But on the inside, there's something brewing. And it, it is up to us to be very aware of that, especially as homeschoolers, because we're with our kids so much. And we get to, I would say we get to know them in a way that we probably wouldn't if they went to school. And I think, you know, you know, with the pandemic and things that happened, I think the, the, what was so frustrating wasn't the school part of it. It was parents like really getting to see what was going on with their kids. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult because you don't know them in that way. You don't know them as the student. You don't know them, you know, even Mm -hmm. through homework, you can't really see that. But with working with your children so closely, um, you start to really see those patterns of, okay, this is not about a choice. This is about who they are and where they're mm-hmm. at. And sometimes, um, you know, that that does play into neuro- neurodivergence, but every kid is like that. So, you know, the things that you're uh, saying to go, the mindset isn't just for neuro, um, neurodiverse children. Mm-hmm. It works for everyone. Yeah, I think- are you a parent searching for an enriching educational experience for your kids that sparks curiosity, encourages innovation, and embraces diversity through STEM and language arts? Discover Hewitt Learning. As a nonprofit, they are dedicated to providing creative and accessible resources, such as the Adventurous MC Detective Agency, the Well Loved Math and Games, and the Engaging Lightning Lit series. But Hewitt Learning goes beyond curriculum. Their National Innovator Challenge inspires kids to tackle real-world problems, fostering critical thinking and global connection. It's not just a competition. It's an empowering journey towards becoming change makers. Redefine learning and prepare your child to engage meaningfully with our diverse world by visiting Hewitt Learning online at hewittlearning.org slash intuitive. That's hewittlearning.org slash intuitive. Yeah, I think that that's an important point to hone on what you just said right there, because like when we approach all children with a neurotypical lens, like if then, then this, here's your cookie, here's your little switch type of thing, you know, like those types of behavior reinforcements, whether it's a positive or negative reinforcement that works for neurotypical kids, but it's not necessarily a healthy thing. And it doesn't work for your um, neurodiverse kids. Like they will push back on that. Mm -hmm. And so if we apply like a neurodiverse lens to all children, whether they're neurodiverse or neurotypical, everybody wins because yeah. it's giving the child autonomy and it's giving them respect and it's asking them for their consent. Or like I say in my course, their agreement, you know, I don't like the word obey and submit and you need to obey me. Like, but I do want you to obey me. But really what I'm <laughs> asking is I want you to agree with me. I want right. you to agree that shoes are a really great thing for going into the grocery store, grocery store. <laughs> right. Can you agree with me? How right. can we make this happen? Or do I need to figure out another time to come to the grocery store? Like mm-hmm. that would be a good swap of like, 
why does my need to go to the grocery store right now supersede their need to not wear shoes? Cause I don't, I don't live in their body. I don't know. Like maybe this is just too hard for them that day. Yeah. Then, then I just need to let the, like we, we have enough food at home for today. <laughs> yeah. It so, gives us the opportunity as parents to really go into what is going on, not mm-hmm. just how I'm feeling or what's on my list, but what is going on? Because it's not really, even if you have a child that can be, you know, very vocal and, you know, always want to, especially as they get older, they're going to always say the opposite of whatever you're saying. Right. But, you know, I always say the thing that you think is the thing is not the thing. So mm-hmm. if a child is presenting themselves as you know, bad. I hate that, but you know, it's never that they're bad. There are no bad kids. There's just some misunderstanding. And a lot of times it's related to our expectations. Yes. Let's be clear. And that's difficult, but Mm -hmm. yeah. It is difficult and it's painful because now we've got to look at ourselves and we have to consider like, okay, what's my role in this? Like my child is behaving in a way that society or I consider maybe not okay. Yeah. What about, where is my part in this? And and how do I own my part? Because how are they ever supposed to own their part if I can't own my part? Mm-hmm. And recognizing like, hey, I'm doing the best I can. I am making mistakes every day. I'm trying to, to take responsibility. And when I realize I've made a mistake, I'm here to repair it. And if I don't realize I've made a mistake and you realize that I've made a mistake, I want you to come to me. And that's one of the things I tell my kids is like, we have a one, two, three policy in our home. Like if you've got a problem with another human being in our home, then it's your responsibility to let that individual know you're not okay with them. Hmm. And you know, otherwise we can't just like wait, wait for people to notice as much as we do believe in behavior as communication. It's also not my job constantly checking in on everyone. Yes. <laughs> like that's bad boundaries. That's, woo, that's tiring. <laughs> yeah. So like, we want to just, there's just rules. Like we all want to be in relationship. If you've got a problem with me as mom, I want you to come tell me, I'm going to consider it. And if I have an apology to make, I will make it right? Yes. That's painful because then I am like, Oh, I was wrong. Yeah. I'm going to learn from that. I'm deciding to learn from that because that's a growth mindset. Scarcity mindset says I have to somehow convince you through manipulation that I wasn't wrong. And that's mm-hmm. not helping. What are mm-hmm. you teaching then? Absolutely. Cause we want to be, you know, that model. I mean, that's ideally what, what we would like to do. And even in our, in our failures, we still mm-hmm. want to show them like, Hey, you know, I messed up. And it's okay. Cause we all say, oh, mistakes are part of the process. It's fine. But when they make a mistake, how do you respond? And mm-hmm. really when you make a mistake, how do you respond? So mm-hmm. it's really, it's a lot. And that's the thing we've talked about it before on other interviews and just conversations when it comes to homeschooling, it's not just about the kids and that part of it. Cause it's probably the most difficult part <laughs> that people realize, like, it's not as easy as just throwing some workbooks together and, you know, reading some books. It's very emotional. And yeah, um, yeah but it's, it's a great way for everybody to grow. You know, right. hopefully it's not really about academics. It really isn't. It's but that, listen, we can, it's, about, it's about relationship. And if it's a relationship <laughs> really part, is. the academics, those, those do come like our mm-hmm. kids are academically on point or above average, you know. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, the academics seem to be the easier part that I've found <laughs> in my almost 10 years. That's mm-hmm. like, that's the easiest stuff to check off. But the character, like you talked about before and just the modeling, and I love to show my kids, this is adulting. Like I'm yes. pulling back that veil. Like it's not all, you know, you get to do what you want and go where you want and whatever. It's a lot of, you know, compromises and thinking things through and a lot of things that I, I let them practice. Cause I'm mm-hmm. like, you're going to need it. These are skills. These are not yeah. just mom wants you to do it. You're going to need this stuff. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. I tell my kids on a daily basis. I don't like cleaning the kitchen in case anybody thinks that I do right. this. I don't no. You gotta I do, do this it because somebody needs to do it. Yeah. And I'm not going to clean this whole house. So pick an area. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's realistic. That's, that's real adulting. That's maturity. Um, let's talk about trust a little bit, because all of this really comes down to trust when you are learning or, you know, de-schooling yourself, whether it is you're focusing on homeschooling, but it's really not about homeschooling when you're de-schooling either. But, um, you know, when you're going through this process of unlearning and relearning, you have to really trust that the path you're on is, is the right one in this stage. So why is trust so important when it comes to just homeschooling or just, uh, parenting in general? Yeah, that's, that is, that's a big question, right? Um, Trust is one of those things that you can't extend unless you trust yourself. That's what I think. 
So if I don't trust myself, then I don't really trust anyone else. And so you have to do that work first of like, do I trust myself? And when you start, if this is for anybody who's just starting homeschooling and you're like deep in research and looking at what everyone else is doing, like this is part of learning. You're in the transition. When you start your your first job out of high school or out of college, there was a steep learning curve. You feel like you're drinking water out of the fire hose. Like that's part of the process. And so if that's you, just keep moving forward, do your due diligence, and then give yourself compassion that that you don't know what you don't know at this point. So it's really great. My first advice would be like, less is more, just maintain relationship for your kids. um, And then make sure you're giving yourself time to rest because don't get all gung ho on keeping up with the school system. Mm -hmm. No. And then, (laughs) and then through that, like trust your intuition, right? Like I love the name of this podcast, like the intuitive family podcast. It's, um, so important to trust your instincts. And I know when I was a new mom and, you know, I still get knocked around by this, like, you know, an expert will tell me something. And then I'm like, that goes in direct opposition of everything that I knew about myself. (laughs) What do I do with this? So then what do you do? You hit Google and you're Googling all (laughs) the things all over again. And then when you kind of like your brain starts to cool off a little bit, you're like, no, wait a second. Right. I know who I am and I know who my kid is. And this expert is an expert of like a lot of things and a lot of people, but they don't know me and they don't know my kid. I know me. I know my kid. I've opted out of the school system for me. I've opted out of corporate America. You know, I'm sort of holistic. So like, you know, there's all sorts of things I've opted out of. And so why am I jumping back into that big pond when I have kind of extracted myself? So all that to say is you have to trust yourself and trust is learned. Like we learn to trust ourselves and then we learn through the lens of our own experience. Like maybe you haven't homeschooled before, but you've been parenting. And before you were parenting, you were succeeding in other things. So you know what you're capable of and remind yourself of that. And then when you can trust yourself, then you can extend the trust outward to others. And trust is really built out of fear. Mm. Because you, when you feel fear, it means that you don't feel safe and you need help and you can choose to ask for help or you can choose to tough it out. And if you choose to ask for help, that's a growth mindset. And by getting the help that you've asked for, that builds trust with wherever you got your help from, whether it was Google, your mom, your friend, or, but if you hold on to, I'm going to figure this out myself, you're living in a big old forest of anxiety and that, that can spiral you. So that's where I kind of like see the importance of trust. Like we have to trust ourselves and then we need to develop trust by asking for help. For sure. I love that. And, you know, one of the big things that people feel in the first, you know, few years for sure with homeschooling and probably parenting, but, you know, for what we're talking about homeschooling is that lack of confidence. And what they don't realize is that that trust in yourself and being like, you know what, I'm going to see this through whether it hurts or not. I'm just going to see what happens. That trust leads to that confidence because you have the experience of knowing, well, that didn't work or this did work or I found a different way to do whatever. And like what I, I tell my kids, like if they're unsure about something new, they're learning and they just can't get in there frustrated. I'm like, well, remember when this worked? Remember you didn't know how to do this? You didn't know how to play Minecraft. You didn't know how to ride your bike. You didn't know how to do this, but you learned. So what's different about this? It's that trusting that I've been there before. I can do it again. And even when you're homeschooling, just because you haven't homeschooled before, you've been a student, you've been a parent, you know, you've had these experiences that you can draw from to say, hey, well, let me just try it. It's hard. But it's, it's that confidence comes from that trust. And the process is the process, whether you homeschool or not. <laughs> Your kids go to school, you still have to trust this process. That's right. Yeah, okay. so it does, it's not limited to homeschooling. But homeschooling is special. We know it's yes. a different type of thing. And you need community so much, like community it- in homeschooling. And then you need someone, whether you find someone who's in your community, that's ahead of you on the road that can coach you or just hire a coach, you coach, I coach, get in a coaching program, get in a community where you can really resource yourself with people who are speaking your language. Like, you know, that's so critical. 
Mm -hmm. Community is so, and it can take a minute and now it can be really difficult sometimes, but those people are out there. And like you said, even if it's just a coach, you know, that person can validate you. Cause a lot of times, and I know, you know, this just personally working with people, a lot of times people really do know what they're doing. They just have to be reminded like, well, why are you thinking that didn't work? And it's like, oh, well, I guess, <laughs> I guess it did. It didn't look how I thought it was going to look, but at the end of the day, it worked. And yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. You're just talking to someone who also knows coming from the same reference point, right? You know, getting coached from a mom who has a child in the school system is probably going to be helpful in a lot of ways, but she's also not able to speak your language because right. you're homeschooling. But yeah. talking to another homeschool mom is going to be able to speak your language as long as they are kind of of like minds. You know, there are mm -hmm. different types of, and lots of ways to homeschool. And I'm just here to say, find the people that resonate with you. And if you're not sure you're with them, then you're probably not with them. Yeah. <laughs> Trust that. <laughs> Trust that feeling for sure. Um, I would love to know how has intuition played a part in your family's journey? Um, it, that's a okay. So I love this question. I love this question because it's one of my like my real passionate points. I was just meeting a new mom at the pool the other day, and um, I actually met her husband while she was helping out her younger daughter, and she was he was talking to me about concerns they had over this little boy's health. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this sounds like my five-year-old. And I just felt this deep need in, in like physically in my body to let them know that they've got this. Mm -hmm. And so I told them that I said, you've got, you guys have this, you know, this little boy, doctors are trying to help out. Um, you know, therapists, all of these people are great, but, but if they say something that goes against your beliefs and, and knowledge of your son, go with your gut. Because I, I didn't trust myself when I first started mothering and homeschooling. And so I was running us ragged to all kinds of therapies and different things. And my husband looked at me and was like, uh, at this point in time, you've got like a PhD in this stuff. So why don't you just do it your way? And I was like, yeah. oh, that's so revolutionary to me, but he's right. <laughs> like, I don't feel good about this. It's stressing me out. It's stressing her out. We're not getting the results we need. Why don't I just try it different, differently. And then when I started moving into that and it started to work, you know, it didn't fix all of our problems, obviously, but it was really able to show me that my intuition is on point. And yeah. I trust my intuition now more than I trust anybody else. You know, yeah. like, I trust the <laughs> Lord more, but like, that's pretty much it. <laughs> you know, cause it's so powerful. It's just a powerful tool that we really, we dismiss in our society because we're big on data. We're big on logic and we're big on testimony of other people, which is fine until something inside of you is working against that. And then you need to pay attention to that. That's right. That's so true. And you know, the whole intuition things feel so woo woo for some people, but all of us have it. And so I think we should cultivate that gift and really use it to help ourselves and others. And so, yeah, I love that. Like, you know, follow that passion and don't, you know, it could be easy to feel like, you know, you don't want to put yourself out there or, you know, somebody's going to say something you don't like, but at the end of the day, you got to do what's true for you. And a lot of times your intuition leads you there. Yes. And, sure. and letting go what other people think. I mean, that's easier said than done. It's yeah. not like I figured that part out, but I'm better at it than I used to be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Just like, you know what I need sanity matters more to me than anything else. Yeah, <laughs> so for sure. If you're going to yeah. steal my peace. Then we can just say peace. <laughs> right. Hello. We need to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> One last question before we get to the lightning round questions that I have for you. Uh, what advice would you give your younger self? Trust yourself. You got this girl. <laughs> you mm. know more than you think you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as far as homeschooling, like homeschooling is really not that hard. We make it harder than it, than it is. <laughs> we do Boy. that to ourselves. <laughs> we laugh because we know we've been there. I that. still catch myself doing it. I'm like, stop it. Stop it with the catalog of activities. <laughs> Every spring and summer, I got to check myself like, wait a minute. We, we know this is not what we need to do, but it looks so good. <laughs> do it all this season. They can, they've got a bunch of right. years to dabble in this stuff. <laughs> it's so funny. But yes, I love that advice. That That is very eternal advice for so many, so many people homeschooling or not. All right. You ready for some lightning round questions? Yes. All right. Favorite drink? Coffee. Introvert or extrovert? 
Oh, I'm an extrovert all the way. <laughs> extrovert and extrovert. <laughs> right. That has come up on a couple of uh, answers that I've uh, asked this question. I'm like, yeah, that's a thing. If you don't think it's a thing, it's a thing. Uh, night owl or early bird? Early bird. Last book you read? Oh, the last book I read. Well, I don't know how you are, Camille, but I am always reading lots of books and never finishing them. So um, I'm currently reading um, Demon Copperhead. Okay. And so that is uh, Barbara Kingsolver, and she has kind of written an Appalachian story of this young man out of foster care who um, it's kind of been pulled from the classic David Copperfield, but she put a new spin on it. So oh. it's good. Oh, nice. I've heard of that. But I haven't oh. finished it. So, you know, check back. Maybe next year. <laughs> Will do. Uh, favorite season of the year? Spring. I love spring. And what's the last TV show that you binged and loved? The, um, it, okay, it's this German um, show called Charit. It was based on the hospital in Berlin in World War two, the second season was, and then before that was when they were trying to find, um, the vaccine for, um, I want to say typhoid, but it's not typhoid. I can't think of it right now, but anyways, great. If you like foreign film and it was really interesting for like historical perspective, cause you kind of look back at this stuff now, like a hundred years later and you're just like, Whoa. So that was wow. my Awesome. Yeah. Kelly, thank you so much for being on the show. I loved having you and I always love our conversations. <laughs> I love being here, Camille. Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. I love my conversation with Kelly Edwards and I hope you did too. You can find Kelly on Instagram at 90 Minutes School Day and her website, www.90minuteschoolday.com, linked in the show notes. And remember, if you're a homeschooler and want to hear more about her homeschooling journey, you can get access to a bonus episode where we discuss that and more by joining Homeschool U Academy, my online school for homeschooling parents. Learn more via a link in the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Intuitive Family Podcast. I would love to know your thoughts about the show. So please leave a rating and review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you love the show, help me spread the word by sharing it with other families you know. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to the podcast and follow me on my socials linked in the show notes. See you for my next episode.